Happy Mother's Day, moms. So, so thankful to see each and every one of you here um, this morning. I, I found this article this past week called Lessons I Learned from My Mother, and so I'm sure some of you, uh, some of you could uh, uh, assent to this or understand this. So there's a whole list of them. I'm only going to read a few. My mom taught me to appreciate a job well done. She would say this often, if you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. <laughs> My mother taught me religion. You better pray that's going to come out of the carpet. <laughs> My mother taught me about stamina. You're going to sit there until all that spinach is gone, all right? My mom taught me about hypocrisy. I, any, any parent has said this, right? If I told you once, I've told you a million times. Don't exaggerate. <laughs> And finally, my mom taught me about justice. One day you'll have kids, and I hope they turn out to be just like you. <laughs> to which we all are like, oh, Lord, no. Well, we're going to uh, be in James chapter 3 this morning. On your way out, there will be some young, dress, sharply dressed young men. I'll put it that way. Sharply dressed young men on your way out who will be holding baskets. And uh, I have a pastor acquaintance, it's not really a friend, a pastor acquaintance, whose wife, uh, she makes handcrafted, organic, any other descriptor you want to put in front of that. Um, uh, it's a, it's, this one is a lemon-scented uh, hand soap. And uh, even, the, even the label is organic. Ladies, you can, if you're a gardener, you can take that label, put it under the, gra- under the dirt, pour water on it, and something is going to spring forth from it, all right? So if you're, uh, we, we are very conscious around here, all right? So you'll have a good time with that, okay? All right, James chapter 3, I'm going to pray, and then we'll get into the word. Father, help us this morning, and I thank you for each and every mom uh, here, for those who have the, the ache of their heart and maybe the, the desire for children, and, and you haven't granted that to them, may they know that uh, even on a day like this, they are loved and cherished uh, here and amongst uh, their family. Uh, Lord, I pray for the mom whose heart is hurting because of uh, a distanced, uh, a strained relationship. Give grace today. Um, for those where the relationships are close and, and, and uh, tight, uh, grant to them great joy today. Most of all, Lord, we thank you that um, you treat us as your children if we're in Christ. And we have nothing to fear. We can come to you with all the aches, the burdens, the joys, uh, the questions, the fears, the anxieties of our heart. Uh, meet us in our time of need, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to give to you three stories that illustrate our culture's generally accepted wisdom. Three quick stories, and then we'll get into the passage. These are all things I've heard over this past year, actually, from Christian and non-Christians alike. First one, I, I don't want to force Christianity on my kids. Uh, I think it's important that they explore and then make their choice. I mean, Christianity works for me, uh, but it may not work best for them. Here's a second one. You know, we, we both come from homes with painful divorces. And we don't want to repeat that mistake, so we've decided we're going to live together to see if we're compatible Plus, it's just better for us financially. Here's the third one. I'm a truth teller. If someone doesn't like it, the truth hurts. It doesn't always come out the best way, but at least everyone knows where I stand. Each of these stories that I just gave are a window into our culture's generally accepted wisdom. And the point of the text this morning isn't really to address any one of those in specific But the point of our text is to tell us this, that there is a wisdom that we're supposed to reject and that there is a wisdom that we're supposed to receive as followers of Jesus. So you're in James chapter 3. Let's begin in verse 13 where it reads this way. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So just like James chapter 2 said, true faith demonstrates itself out in specific works, James chapter 3 says that true wisdom demonstrates itself in a specific, there's going to be specific acts or feels, if you want to put it that way, from James chapter 3. Now when I use the word wisdom, let me be clear what I What I do not mean, I am not talking about common sense quotes that we get from our great aunt. 
or kind of just kind of wisdom or aphorisms that we get from, from grandpa. Uh, that's not the wisdom that I'm talking about. I'm not even talking about a well-timed piece of advice that you're considering uh, a, a, a key decision in your life. I'm not talking about a well-timed piece of advice for a difficult situation. The Bible's teaching about wisdom is this, is that it's much broader. That actually God's wisdom, yes, it is for specific situations, that God's wisdom is actually a way of life. It's how, we, it's how we choose to live. So Proverbs will say this in Proverbs chapter 1, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of, of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And then so that the rest of Proverbs then is an unpacking of what it look, looks like to live wisely and what it looks like to live foolishly. So Proverbs is reminding us then that wisdom isn't necessarily just a key piece of information when you need to make a a difficult decision, but that actually wisdom is how we as followers of Jesus choose to live our lives underneath the guidance of this thing called the Bible. Sometimes, you know, we find ourselves when we're looking for wisdom, we find ourselves in difficult situations, let's just be honest, because we've abandoned God's word. Sometimes we're, we're looking to escape, we're looking for wisdom because we're looking to escape the consequences of our decisions. So biblical wisdom then is not just about individual decisions. Here's what biblical wisdom is. Biblical wisdom is who have you made as your authority in your life? And from that comes the wisdom by which we learn to navigate the difficulties of life itself. That's what James is, is going to go after this, this morning, that the wisdom is actually how do we honor God in each and every situation. It's, it's, he would say it this way, it's wisdom that's from above. But first, James is going to give to us a negative example of worldly wisdom. Our text is very simple this morning, just two points. There are, gives us two, James gives us two simple commands. Here's command number one, hey, reject worldly wisdom. He's going to tell us what godly wisdom is not. Look at verse 14 of James chapter 3. He says this, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. So the first thing he says to us, let me tell you what godly wisdom is not. It is not bitter jealousy. What is bitterness? You, you do know what bitterness is. Let me explain. Bitterness is, is anger multiplied over time. Anger takes place in a moment. It, it occurs over a, a, a moment itself. It occurs in an event. It occurs in a conversation. It occurs with a person. But it's not just anger in that moment. It's that same anger multiplied out over day, over day, after day, after day, after day. So sometimes we'll talk about teenagers being bitter against their parents. What, what, we mean, what, what, what oftentimes we mean by that is there's some act or event or maybe a multiplicity of acts or events in which that individual is still angry. Why does the Bible say to husbands, hey, uh, be not bitter against your spouse, your wife? Because somehow the Spirit of God knows that men, rather than kind of working through and becoming peacemakers, that we hold on to something and we become embittered against our spouse. So he says this, bitter jealousy is not wisdom. It's selfish ambition. The, the idea of selfish ambition is just that of a, of a, part, of a party spirit. I, I don't mean by that like New Year's Eve party. I mean by that like more like a political party. Like a, a party spirit of, of, of being more loyal to yourself than to God. Him, than to God. That this bitter jealousy and this selfish ambition that when they are mixed together, they are a deadly concoction that actually kills what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Selfish ambition, what is selfish ambition? It, it simply is this, it pursues what it wants to pursue. It desires what it desires. It takes what it wants. It goes after what it, what it desires. It's as simple as that, even at the expense of others. It, it rejects Jesus' command to deny yourself is what it does. 
and to follow him. It rejects the command, right? This idea of selfish ambition. It rejects Jesus' command to what? It's the royal law. To love your neighbor as yourself. And what happens then when, when we choose to live this way? Look at verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Now, that just seems a little bit harsh to me. Does that seem harsh to you? Like, okay, Joel, I get it. There are times where I am a little bit bitter or a little bit jealous or maybe bitter jealousy or maybe a little bit of selfish ambition, but come on. I've been, do, I've been living this life and I don't see anything of great disorder or of any type of great kind of vile practice going on. So what, would, what could this look like in our homes? What could this look like in our relationships? When we pursue an idea or an objective that the Bible forbids, what we are, what we are pursuing is a selfish ambition. We're saying that we actually think we're more wise than God and that though God's word is given to us to kind of, to allow us to flourish relationally, that we actually have more wisdom than God himself. So here's what, this is what it, this is what it could look like in a home. When children listen in on our conversations about other people and we ourselves are unable to rejoice with other people's successes, unknowingly we are modeling for our children that it is okay to be jealous of other people's possessions, their job promotions, their families, their vacations. This happens, this, ha- this, could, ha- this could happen in our home when we consistently shelter our children from their contributions to relational conflict as if everybody else is out to get them. Kind of ha- ha- creating, in, creating in them kind of that, that, that spirit of bitterness or jealousy that they're not actually functioning as servants. This happens in marriages, when instead of working as a team and parenting, we become competitors for our children's affections. We get jealous of it. And this happens in a church when you think that, hey, why didn't I get that ministry role? I'm better at that than they are. This is that bitter jealousy that, and James is saying, listen, when this begins to creep out, you are not functioning with godly wisdom. Do you see how God, when godly wisdom is only defined as a piece of tidbit information for a difficult decision, that you're completely undermining exactly what James is saying? That James is saying that true biblical wisdom is how we choose to live our life in every facet, every aspect of life, that it kind of it pushes itself out into other, other areas. And notice what James says in verse 15. He says, This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. It's earthly, it's unspiritual, like, well, okay, I don't necessarily like that, but I, okay, so far, so good. It's earthly, unspiritual, but look at the last word. He says it's demonic. Friends, he's, he's saying to us that when we pursue ways of living that are not under the submission of God's word, that we're actually pursuing wisdom that's earthly, that's sensual, and that's demonic. You know, I imagine that if, if, you, if we knew that the wisdom that we're embracing is demonic, I imagine that we would reject it. Right, if we knew that it, was, that it actually had the, the smell of sulfuric uh, hell on it, that we would reject it. But do you remember what, how Paul describes Satan in 2 Corinthians chapter 11? He says that Satan is an angel of light. I would imagine that if our chief adversary, Satan himself, masquerades as an angel of light, it should not shock us if demonic wisdom sounds more appealing to us on the surface. So that those opening three illustrations that maybe you actually have, maybe you've actually said something like that. Maybe you've actually given advice like that. Because it is kind of the commonly accepted wisdom of our day. And James would say to us, it's earthly. That's sensual. That's demonic. Rejected. You know, we tend to be very, 
we tend to be very pragmatic, right? We're Westerners. We're Americans. If it works, it's got to be okay, right? And James is, James is saying to, to followers of Jesus, I want to move you beyond Western Americanism. I want to move you beyond pragmatic wisdom. I want to move you beyond, beyond just kind of hellish wisdom. I want to move you toward godly wisdom. I want to show you that there's actually a better way to live your life, that there's a better thing to pursue itself. And oftentimes, here's what we, oftentimes we imply that if someone has knowledge, that they are wise. And what James is going to show us is this, knowledge does not equal wisdom. That you can have all the degrees, you can have theological degrees behind your name, you can have grown up in a Sunday school, you could be able to uh, kind of teach through various difficult passages of the Bible, but that doesn't mean you have wisdom. Godly wisdom is actually much different. So here's the second command. The first command was reject ungodly wisdom. Here's the second one. Receive godly wisdom. Right? A lot easier than simple, but it's more difficult than it sounds. And, and he's going to tell us this, that godly wisdom is not found by looking within. Don't look within. Don't even look to the great aunt or the, the, the grandfather. That's not where godly wisdom is found. He's going to say this. Don't look within. Look where? Look up. Metaphor, right? Look at verse 17. He says this. But the wisdom from above is, is, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. Gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Godly wisdom is described with these eight character traits. Let me just kind of go through them. He says, first of all, that godly wisdom is pure. It's, it's free from defilement. That godly wisdom will not suggest, nor will it condone, that which is unclean or vile. That godly wisdom is pure, it's, it's free from defilement. It, godly wisdom is peaceable. It's peace-loving. It's disposed to peace. You know, some Christians seem like they're always looking for a fight, right? Constantly, every time you turn around, we, we're, we're going to have to debate something, and we're going to have to figure out what side of the position you're on on this. James is saying that godly wisdom is peaceable. Brothers and sisters, if someone is going to dismiss us, let it be for our position. Don't let it be for our disposition. It's peaceable. That there is something, that there ought to be something in your life. And I know everybody has different personalities, so I'm not asking you to be a different personality than who God has already wired you to be. But I'm saying that godly wisdom is peaceable. That in the midst of your Tasmanian devil's life, busyness is what I mean, that there's still a peace about you. He says we're to be gentle. Uh, gentle just simply means this. It uh, means a person of moderation. One commentator wrote it this way. This is going to hurt those of us who have our bent towards legalism. Someone who is not a stickler for the letter of the law. Uh, uh, in fact, a qualification for elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is someone who is gentle, someone who is moderate, someone who, who gives room for other people. For those of us given to rigidity, James is saying heavenly wisdom is gentle. It's not harsh. It's, it's open to reason. Meaning by that, that, that genuine wisdom, biblical wisdom, wisdom that is from above is approachable. We would even say it's this way, it's, it's easily persuaded. And what we mean by that is this, is it's not that wisdom that's from above is naive, like, oh, and then they listen and then they follow that. That's not what James is getting at. But genuine wisdom is not so dogmatic on every little issue that you can't listen to a, a position or an opinion different than yourself. That this is, this is what wisdom looks like. This is what wisdom feels like. 
It weighs all the factors in a decision. It's not predisposed to whatever helps him or her. It's, it's full of mercy. The full of mercy just means this. It, there's, an outward, there's an outward manifestation of pity. I don't mean pity in a kind of feeling bad for everyone who's different than you. I just mean by that there's, there's, there's genuine mercy. Friends, if you, I, would, I am willing to stack up any world system against Jesus' mercy any day of the week. You just think about this for a moment. What does Darwin teach us? Darwin teaches us that it's the survival of the fittest. What does Jesus do? Let the children come unto me. Darwin says it's, it's, it's might that is right. And Jesus says, I'm going to heal the blind. I'm going to heal the, the lame. I'm going to give sight to those who can't see. What does Marx teach us? Marx teaches us that the oppressors must be overthrown. And Jesus says, yes, even for oppressors there is judgment. But I will say this, that there is even saving mercy for those who don't deserve it. Religion. What does religion say? Religion says, get your act together. Start acting correctly. And God says, my, I sent my son for those who can't get their act together. And in him, they find mercy. Friends, yes, there are difficulties with world systems and uh, arguments and attacks against Christianity. I understand that. But when you stack up genuine Jesus Christianity against any worldview, I'll take Jesus' worldview any day of the week. Because there is mercy for me. Where where the good fruits that James is talking about here, that wisdom that is from above uh, has good fruits, he simply means this. Are you okay with this? Can you be comfortable with this? That wisdom that is from above is full of kind deeds. The believer of heavenly, where heavenly wisdom, the believer of heavenly wisdom will be full of good fruits, right? That's James chapter 2, that faith that is genuine actually works itself out where people can see it. He says that wisdom that is from above next is impartial. That means, right, there's no bias with wisdom that's from above, that God is not swayed by the the size of a person's bank account or the number of degrees uh, degrees that they've obtained or even their spiritual pedigree. That true wisdom that's from above is impartial, that what it says to one person, it will say to the next person, that what it says to this person, it'll say to this person. It is impartial in every way. It is sincere, meaning by that it's without hypocrisy. And the idea there is this, is that in, in those days is that a, uh, a Greek actor would wear a, a mask in, on a, in a play. They were, when they would wear that mask, they were called hypocrites. He's saying here that true wisdom is without hypocrisy. It's, it's, the, it's the negative of hypocrisy is the word behind there, but they translate it sincere. It's without hypocrisy. That fake Christians don't have genuine wisdom. That those who live authentically actually have more of heaven's wisdom than those who look as if they've got it all together on the outside. Wisdom will come for grace life. I want to say this. So the, here's the temptation. The temptation, if you were here for our, our weekend on anxiety and depression, uh, Keith used this illustration in another context. But here's what happens when you come to passages like this. It's like, oh, I need a little sincerity. I need a, I need a little bit of, uh, of, of peace or a purity. And so what, what we tend to think to ourselves is if I can imagine that myself, that I'm a tree and I've got all these fruits on here that I don't like, and we come to a list like this, well, it's like, ooh, I need a little purity. Okay, well, I better stop this here. And I need a little bit of peace, so I better not be so combative. And I need a little bit, and, we, and over time what we begin to do then is we begin to try to staple on apples <laughs> to our apple tree. But meanwhile, while that apple tree is bearing forth 
bad fruit. The key is not just to kind of clip those bad pieces of fruit and then kind of staple on good fruit. What you need to do is you need to change what goes into the soil and allow from from what comes inside the tree then over time to begin to develop fruit that is actually worth receiving and, and and commends the grace of God. Folks, wisdom will come as you seek the person of Jesus and the word of Jesus. Friends, if you, if you think that Jesus, is, Jesus was kind of your ticket into heaven and you got the ticket and you threw it in your back pocket and now you're just going to kind of live your life, what James is saying is pull that ticket out and continue to gaze and pursue Jesus. And that as you pursue and as you allow Jesus to have more and more of your life, your life will begin to change because who is pure? Jesus is pure. As you seek Jesus, who is peace, you will become more of a peace-seeking, peace-loving person. As you pursue Jesus, who is gentle, who is approachable, who is full of mercy, who is impartial, who is without hypocrisy, as you pursue your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it's, it's like summertime, right? And you throw on your shorts and your tank top, right? And some of you guys who are brave enough to mow without your shirt on, all right? You get that, you get that sun going on, right? It's, as, as you get closer to the sun, right, you get a little bit more tan, And what James is saying is this, as you get closer to the sun, the S-O-N, you begin to slowly change, and so that now people begin to see, oh, there's purity. Oh, there's peace. That's what gentleness looks like. I didn't grow up with gentleness in my home. That's what it looks like. That's what approachability looks like. That you, you don't need to be in, insecure about difficult conversations. That you can be full of mercy. That you can have kind deeds. Because why? Because Paul will say in Colossians chapter 2, In Him are all the hidden treasures of wisdom. And here's the godly effect of wisdom. Look at verse 18. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I'm not the son of a farmer. I'm a grandson, I guess, of a rancher. The rule of farming is this, that you always harvest more than what you plant. Or to use Paul's language, you always reap more than you sow, positively or negatively. You're always going to reap more than you sow. The end rule of, of, of godliness here is this, is that the more you pursue wisdom, you get and you sow in peace, what do you get? A, a harvest of righteousness. What is the end goal of wisdom? Look at, look at verse 18 again. You got this harvest of righteousness, that's the effect, but what is the end goal of wisdom according to verse 18? It's, it's shalom. It's peace, right? Because if you've got all this wisdom and you're walking around sowing in peace by those who make peace, the effect of that is this, a harvest of righteousness, I thought wisdom was just so that I could give kind of pithy aphorisms to my grandkids when they get older. So that when I get gray hair that people will go, oh, what a wise person she is or he is. No, that that is not the effect of, that's not the purpose of wisdom. That the wisdom that you are to be pursuing, that we are to be pursuing is so this, so that we can then dispense shalom. Shalom is the Jewish idea of of wholeness, of of peace. It's not just kind of a, it's not just kind of, you know, flashing the peace sign. It's it's more about that, that wherever we go, there is a sense of wholeness, of peace that is granted to those who God places around us. He's saying, this is the end goal of the wisdom that I want you to pursue, the con- look, friends, what is the context of James 3? The context of James 3 is the Christian church. And the damaging effects of what? The tongue. 
James is anticipating that those who are saved by Jesus actually seek Jesus. And as we seek Jesus, we become wise people who effectively plant peace through their wisdom wherever they go. Why do people, why do people want your advice? When they, why do they want your advice? It's because they got a difficulty going on and they don't have the shalom that they desire. And so they desire the peace. They came to you because it looks like you got peace. Why do you have peace? What is it about you that they're seeing that grants to you that they must have the shalom, even though they would never use that word. They've got the shalom that I need. As your pastor, what I'm hoping it is, is this. It's not just that you've kind of put a great facade on the outside, but that it's actually that you are arranging and ordering your life underneath this book. Because wisdom is not just about witty aphorisms. Wisdom is saying, I want to arrange my book, my, my life, according to this book, that wisdom is actually a way of life. And so I come to you because I don't have the peace that I need, and so I need something from you. You must be arranging your life in a way that I'm not because I need what you got. James is anticipating that those who are saved by Jesus are seeking Jesus. I want to have just a few questions. How many, according to verse 18, how many churches experience this harvest of righteousness? Let me get a little bit more specific. How many Christian families experience this harvest of righteousness? Or is it when we sit down the knives come out, not just literally, because there's steak on the table, but they, came out, they come out figuratively because we brought our words. Our words become knives. And our homes have become just kind of perpetual knife fights. How many churches, how many Christian families experience this harvest of righteousness? And I know as soon as I say that, you may be thinking about how you were raised. And it's like, <laughs> Mosier, if you only knew. I mean, I'm, I'm in a pretty good spot compared to how I was raised. And I want to I commend you for that and say, praise God. But I also want to push you and say what James is expecting of individual Christians and of Christian churches is that there is a harvest of righteousness that happens because as we pursue, pursuing wisdom isn't the end goal. Pursuing wisdom allows us to have the effects of peace which, which allows for righteousness. If Grace Life were to be this type of a church in James chapter 3 verse 18, I want to ask you this question. What would have to change about you? I think it's fair to ask myself and our elders, what would have to change about us? Or to our deacons, what would have to change about you? Or to our church members, what would have to change about you? If your family were to experience what verse 18 is talking about, what would have to change about you? And I want to be careful, don't just rip off the bad fruit and staple on good fruit. Right? Because ultimately it's not just... I need to be more gentle. No, ultimately what you need is you need more of Jesus. That's what we need. That's what we need. And so if, if biblical wisdom is more than, more than pithy sayings, and if biblical wisdom is actually a way of life to which you submit yourself more and more to the Bible, here's a dilemma that we're all going to face. Right? Because some of you are nervous this morning. Because you're like, okay, I know I need this, but if you're going to do this, here's where your nervous comes in. If you're going to, that you are nervous because then you're going to have to make God the authority in your life. And, and you're, you're just nervous. If I let go of this, what does that mean for my career? If I let go of this, what does that mean for the relationship, relationships or relationship in my life? And ultimately, I, what this means is, if, if we decide to hold on, it means that we don't want to give complete control to God of our lives. And I want to give you a newsflash. God doesn't do co-pilot. 
who doesn't do co-pilot. Like, you can sit in the, you can sit in the back cabin. <laughs> He'll even let you have, you know, your parachute if you want it. But he gets to fly the plane. Either he's in charge or you're in charge. That's what James is getting, getting at here. And so I want to conclude this way. The very first question that was asked in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Your God does not command anything but that which will help you flourish spiritually as a human being. There's nothing that God will withhold from us that is not for our good. But if you're wiser than God, you're going to reject that counsel. And the word from the Holy Spirit to us as a church is, who is wise? Let him hear the word and obey. Let's pray.